Well, it's fairly well accepted that the, the founding father of the modern evidence-based medicine movement is uh, Dr. David Sackett. And uh, I'm actually talking to a, a physician who actually worked with, uh, with, with Dr. Sackett. Robert, I believe you worked with him uh, in Canada? Yes, yeah, a long time ago. Uh, David, uh, Dave and I were in charge of the two admitting teams at McMaster University, uh, which is in Hamilton, Ontario. And uh, Dave and I would run into each other most days of the week uh, as we were doing our ward rounds. So um, I, this was the time when the ideas of uh, evidence-based medicine were being developed. And I don't think I've met too many people more enthusiastic or keen, keener to transmit those ideas than, than did Dave. So he, uh, he talked the talk guy. and also walked the walk. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And did he actually take pains to practice the evidence base as it was at that time in his, in his clinical practice and in his teaching? Oh, very much so. Uh, in fact, it used to drive us crazy because I could never finish a ward round because he'd, he'd see you in the, in the ward and he'd sort of run over and say, look, come over here and uh, I'm just going through some of these ideas. And so it was a constant tutorial for us all. But uh, w one thing I'll say, um, Dave's concept of evidence-based medicine is very, very different to the way it's been translated to people who want to use components of that for their own purposes. Um, I found uh, his ideas very, very exciting at the time, uh, sort of innovative. But, you know, to s suggest that people did things in medicine before Dave Sackett, uh, because we didn't do things on the basis of evidence, of course, is total nonsense. What, what Dave did, he brought together three prongs. He brought together the idea that uh, analysis of good quality science in medicine was critically important. He identified randomised controlled trials done, done well was uh, high up in, in the hierarchy of that evidence profile. But he involved two other very important areas. First, the information and knowledge and experience of the experienced clinician. Uh, he felt that was extremely important because uh, medicine is not just science. Uh, and the science is always a touch limited. You know, you do a study on uh, an uncommon disease uh, and the disease may have a, a width of presentations. You confine that to a certain component. You do a randomised controlled trial. That may not be incredibly relevant to other people with a similar diagnosis. And, you know, there are many ways in which uh, this can be discussed. So that was the first addition to the analysis of the data. The second addition and the third prong was patient expectations. David always felt uh, rightly that the role of the patient was incredibly important. Uh, and this gets back to what I certainly see as one of the, the basis of uh, good clinical medicine, and that is the relationship between the doctor and the patient. So the doctor-patient relationship, which really is a way of describing uh, Dave's uh, contribution of saying, in my evidence-based medicine, uh, I understand the importance of that relationship. And the devastating thing that has occurred, certainly in my country, uh, as a result of COVID, is that important part of evidence-based medicine is essentially taken out of the equation. Uh, doctors can no longer make those decisions using medications, or giving information uh, in, in informed consent in the way in which Dave anticipated. I've actually written somewhere that I think Dave would turn in his grave, the, uh, Dave died some several years back, uh, turn in his grave if he could see the way in which his concept of evidence-based medicine is used to manipulate uh, the way things are occurring now because um, in a sense, I'm not looking at control as being an important thing in medicine, but certainly the input and control aspects of medicine that uh, I would have used to, used to have years ago um, is, is really disappearing very quickly. I think that's remarkably disappointing, isn't it? The fact that now clinicians aren't really, and I don't, I don't think it's too strong a word to say, aren't allowed 
to, to use their clinical discretion in their clinical acumen built, built up over years and sometimes decades. And we, we've both been in this situation uh, many, many times. I, I'll sometimes go into a cubicle and there's a patient there and I, I'm just not happy with them. I, I might not know quite why, you know, just think, no, I'm not happy at all. This patient is not well. I can't quite put my finger on it. You go and get the consultant. You start running a few tests and you do find out there is some significant pathology that I was able to gauge intuitively just because this is something you've been doing for a, a few decades. That that does seem to be cut out now in expense and replaced by, by fairly rigid protocols and almost a, a, a top-down dictatorial approach uh, to, to uh, diagnosis and treatment. I think, and, and the worst part about the top-down, uh, drip-down uh, way of approaching clinical medicine is that uh, it's not the, not the experienced doctors that are even putting that drip-down protocol approach together. Uh, it's uh, people who are outside of the doctor-patient relationship, uh, sometimes with little or no uh, clinical experience. Uh, I, I have to smile from time to time when I see these very powerful people uh, around the world, particularly in America, uh, making all sorts of dogmatic statements. And I know they haven't actually seen a patient for 20 or 30 years, if ever. Uh, and, and certainly they're not actively involved in making those decisions because clinical decisions uh, are not just based on science. It's based on your experience, uh, the particular... Every patient is different. Uh, which, which makes clinical medicine such a, a challenging and interesting area to work in. Um, I work in clinical immunology where certainly no pa two patients uh, are the same. And uh, you have to sit and work out with the patient what's important uh, and, and prioritise those areas of importance, use the information you have, translate that. And, and you work out a programme for every patient quite separately. And if we take the third component, the, uh, the, the patient expectation and the interaction of the patient with the clinician, I mean, if this is working well and the patient's expectations are being met, then surely we are maximising the placebo effect, which I don't think should ever be minimised. Because we want the effect of the therapeutic. Well, and if I can have the placebo effect as well, thank you very much, I'll certainly have it. Um, don't misjudge the placebo effect. The, uh, as an immunologist, we got very involved uh, some many years ago. We, we, we actually developed a, a number of studies showing the, the science of the placebo effect. And uh, much of the placebo effect is based on conditioning. Now, if you go back to Pavlov where he'd you know, ring the bell and the dogs would get hungry and salivate, um, that type of conditioning uh, is uh, very much part of the placebo effect. And... Um, it, it, it is known that you can actually condition um, by using psychological technologies and exposure uh, to, for example, dummy unique tastes. You, uh, one example, um, we were setting up a study uh, with a friend of mine who was looking after uh, patients with um, uh, heroin addiction and he was running methadone programs. And I remember he said, if we could get the methadone dose less than 100 milligrams a day, that makes it so much easier for me to help that patient um, with their addiction. But he said, I'm using these massive doses of methadone. And uh, I said, well, look, you know, let's use conditioning to see if we can um, associate methadone with a unique sugar taste so that we can progressively reduce the, the dose. Now, you can do that in mice. Unfortunately, we never got around to doing the study because uh, it, it, the big pharmaceutical companies who we asked for some funds said, oh, well, how on earth would you uh, get a patent on that? Uh, and it, it, it went the natural way of, of good ideas. But, um, the, the, but that would work. I'm sure that would work. Uh, and, and that is the placebo effect. And that's sort of part of this experience and doctor-patient relationship uh, aspects that you put together that no randomised controlled trial which is very contrived, uh, is going to help you. And, and th th this, this clinician-patient relationship, if you get a positive placebo effect, it can be remarkably powerful, can't it? You can really get things that appear almost miraculous. Uh, uh, no, absolutely. Um, you, absolutely. We, um, we, as a clinical immunologist, we, um, the commonest patient that I would see for many years was uh, people with autoimmune disease. 
and we set up a, a nurse, probably the world's first nurse practitioner program in uh, autoimmune disease, particularly SLE or systemic lupus erythematosus. And other people uh, and ourselves did studies showing that if patients came into a nurse practitioner program where they were talking with the nurses, um, no difference in basic therapy, but the people who had the nurse practitioner experience did remarkably better than the ones who uh, were not exposed to that broader input of um, uh, non-intervention therapy, if you like. So it really is the quality of the human interaction there, isn't it? The, the formation of a relationship. It is. It's about relationship and trust uh, and communication. And the converse of that, of course, is if that's not there, especially in this age of telemedicine and things where you're not actually seeing your, your, your doctor very often, I think that's got the possibility of, of, of nocebo effects, which are probably equally frightening. I couldn't agree more. Um, I think that I found with the uh, COVID pandemic, uh, all my clinical medicine was done uh, by telemedicine or phone medicine. And it was frustrating for me, frustrating for the patients. But the interesting thing is now that we're past that, that uh, acute phase, uh, patients sort of quite like not having to get up early in the morning. It's all right for me to get up early in the morning, but they don't like getting up early in the morning. They, they want a, a phone or a, 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 a tele uh, consultation, which is okay if you're just adjusting doses. But yeah. it's very different than someone sitting there and you're communicating. Um, and it's interesting you should raise that because it's been something that I, I felt very strongly about. And I, I've just told the, the girls on the desk where I work that I, I do not want to have do any more of these um, tele, television, unless it's someone who's a long way away and, and have no options. But that's not decrying the value of um, telemedicine because in many circumstances, I, I work with a, 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 a new research institute uh, for rural medicine in New South Wales and uh, I did a circuit of the Aboriginal training program, uh, medical programs and I was very impressed with the way in which uh, they're using um, television and um, communication uh, in, in outback New South Wales for, for management. I mean, I, I find with, especially with ill patients, you know, being able to touch your patient, you can get so much information from that. Um, the, the feel of the skin, how sweaty it is, what temperature it is. You, you just, you know, something as simple yeah. as that, you can just get so much clinical information. And, and as well as that, I think if patients, well, are touched, the, if patients are touched properly and professionally, that's remarkably reassuring for the patient. Yeah, I think a very important part of this too is that if you're sitting in a room, uh, the, often the partner or um, a close friend or relative will come with them and you end up having, if you like, a team approach. And uh, th that sort of communication is inhibited when you put a, a screen between you and the patient. Um, you sh I'm just thinking rare rare to have more than one person on a screen, whereas if you've got... Uh, I find particularly wives are incredibly important that they will pick up things that their their husband... He'll say, oh, I'm fine, I'm terrific, you know, typical male thing, whereas she'll say, well, wait a second, you know, why is it that, you, you know, you don't sleep at night, that you wake up cranky, that you... All of these things, and, and it's all part of the equation, and, and it makes... It contributes to that individual being just that, an, an individual. Amazing, fascinating, Robert. So I vote we get back to uh, David Sackett's original idea where we have as much science as we possibly can with as much empiricism and we collect all the high-quality data we can possibly get, not knocking it at all, bring it on. But that's got to be filtered through individual expertise and experience. And that's got to be filtered through the patient experience and the interrelationship of the patient with their clinicians and with their carers. When we've got those three things together, we're more likely to optimise uh, patient assessment and care. I'd just like to add that um, with respect to the way David's um, ideas have been translated through the ages, 
these ages now, uh, it's become... Uh, there are people who say, oh, it's got to be a randomised controlled trial. They've contracted it way down to a randomised controlled trial without realising that randomised controlled trials are very awkward and difficult in a pandemic. If we look at COVID, there has been no randomised controlled trial showing that vaccines prevent serious disease. It's a whole lot of observational studies. And there are many different ways of getting information. Um, we, we, you know, I think we've talked at various times about some of the um, cheap medications that can be used that are highly effective. But the, there are people around who want to not have this for whatever purposes that they may have. And they say, oh, but where's the randomised controlled trial? Well, it happens that there are quite a few randomised controlled trials, but the focus on the randomised controlled trial has completely taken away the, the importance of analysis of all the information that's available. Sometimes an individual patient experience or single case report can provide input and understanding that you'll never see in a randomised controlled trial. Uh, the observational studies done by serious clinicians uh, for the use of multiple drugs uh, such as ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, I mean, showing dramatically different uh, results. Uh, but no one wants to consider those because, oh, it's not a randomised controlled trial. Now, I ask, who is controlling that scenario? Who's controlling that narrative? Uh, because the randomised controlled trials are multi-multi-million dollar studies paid for by pharmaceutical companies, and they decide who goes into the randomised controller. Let's not put old people in. Oh, dear me, uh, it may not work terribly well with people under the age of 55. So you construct the randomised controlled trial. They do, and that's understandable, with outcomes that are going to support their particular medication or vaccine. Um, and um, we, we need to understand uh, the, the, the importance of all the information being analysed. There's people have looked at an hierarchy of the value, and no doubt good randomised trials, uh, controlled trials, are way at the top of the heap. But there's a lot of bad randomised controlled trials around too. Oh yeah, for sure. And who chooses what we do the trials on, and who writes up the data and all the complications that are associated with potential vested interests uh, around this? Conflict, conflict is so great now. Um, you know, you have to ask every doctor who does a study, you know, who paid for the study, how much do you get paid for? I mean, it's huge amounts of money involved and we won't go into the detail, but I think most of us know uh, that this is a big, big problem. And uh, I suspect having worked with Dr. Sackett, you would know that he would be appalled by this. Oh, as I said earlier, I think he'd turn in his grave uh, if he could see the way his ideas have been translated into decision-making in COVID. Well, but as always, fascinating insight. Uh, someone's actually worked with David Sackett, uh, quite amazing. And uh, as always, thank you very much for your input. As always, my pleasure.